This is DW News, live from Berlin. The UN says three of its peacekeepers and a translator are injured after an explosion on Lebanon's southern border with Israel. Responsibility for the blast is unclear. It comes after Israel vowed to step up its offensive against the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah. And a stark warning from Germany's vice-chancellor. With no end in sight to Russia's war in Ukraine, Robert Habeck says Europeans must be prepared to defend themselves. I'm Ben Fazulan. Welcome. The United Nations peacekeeping force in Lebanon says an explosion has injured three of its observers and a Lebanese translator on the border to Israel. It says they were on foot patrol when a shell struck nearby. The peacekeeping force says it is investigating the incident. Our bureau chief in Beirut, Mohamed Shreta, has more. UN technical observers uh, were on a mission near the blue line uh, on the Lebanese-Israeli border when a blast occurred near their uh, position. The UN peacekeepers operating in southern Lebanon, UNIFIL, confirmed the uh, incident and said uh, it is carrying out uh, investigations uh, to determine the origin of the uh, explosion. Uh, so far, four people have been reportedly uh, injured, uh, three uh, UN foreigners and the Lebanese uh, translator. Of course, the, the UN condemned the uh, incident and said uh, all its missions are carried out in uh, coordination with all active parties on the ground and that the uh, vehicle had clear uh, UN and uh, branding. Now, in Lebanon, the local news agency uh, cited a, um, a military uh, source saying that uh, it's an Israeli drone that launched uh, the attack on the UN uh, vehicle. Of course, the uh, Israeli army is denying responsibility for the attack so far. For the first, uh, fourth day uh, uh, in a row, this uh, front is uh, really uh, peaking. The tension is uh, uh, unprecedented, at least since the beginning of uh, the month of Ramadan, uh, when uh, this front has been uh, cooling down uh, relatively. But now, again, it is looking on the edge of a uh, uh, blow-up. Hezbollah have been uh, firing uh, heavy rockets into uh, new Israeli uh, uh, territory and, and positions. And in return, Israel have been uh, targeting uh, and widening its its targets inside uh, Lebanon, uh, reaching uh, the Bekaa Valley and Baalbek, which is relatively uh, far from the uh, northern, from its northern border. And this is a clear extension of the uh, usual rule of uh, engagement between both uh, parties. Now, there's a growing fear among uh, Lebanese from a large-scale war. Most of people we talk to are very concerned about a war that uh, the country is far from ready uh, for uh, on the uh, financial, logistical, and, and also uh, the uh, mental aspect. The country is going through the worst economic and financial uh, crisis in uh, Lebanon's modern history and barely uh, functioning uh, like the, the UN, the, the um, uh, government organizations is uh, barely able to uh, uh, support the uh, uh, citizens in Lebanon. The United States has authorized a multi-billion dollar weapons package for Israel, according to several media reports. At the same time, President Joe Biden has publicly acknowledged the pain being felt by Arab Americans over the war in Gaza. He's faced criticism by some in his Democratic Party. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant was just in Washington this week. The new arms package is meant to include 1,800 of the most destructive bombs used in Gaza. I asked Middle East expert Daniel Gerlach if the U.S. is so concerned about Israel's conduct in Gaza, why send it 2,000-pound bombs? Yeah, that is a contradiction that is being discussed in the American media uh, a lot. Um, apparently, the Biden administration doesn't see a contradiction here because it says it provides these weapons not to Prime Minister Netanyahu, with whom... They have a difficult relationship at the moment and who is like, of course, calling the shots in the Gaza operation, but that they're providing this for Israel's security. I think for the Biden administration, they're in a way in a lose-lose situation because it's uh, support for the Israeli um, military on the one hand, and then it's, um, it's uh, opposition to the behavior of the Netanyahu government on the other. Uh, leads it into a difficult situation, to a quagmire. Netanyahu has 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 successfully lobbied Congress, uh, not only the Republican Party but also the Democrats, for many years, and uh, he's now cashing in on 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 what he had uh, been successfully doing over the last decades. 
And on the other hand, of course, uh, Joe Biden has uh, opposition inside his own party. Uh, many young Americans, not only Arab Americans, uh, young people in this country see that uh, there is a contradiction in these policies. And if you drive around here in, uh, in, in America, you would probably see at the freeway a billboard which says uh, your taxpayers' money kill, uh, kills children in Gaza. So uh, this is a difficult situation and uh, Biden seems not to be handling it very well. And Joe Biden is also facing criticism for his failure to stop uh, Israel's campaign in Gaza. What leverage does he have with Benjamin Netanyahu when you say that uh, their, their well, relations he, are difficult right now? He, he would probably argue that um, uh, America so far succeeded in delaying the Rafah operation because uh, whereas Netanyahu has announced it's going to happen soon and we will do it, uh, and America said, please don't do it, please don't do it the way you have done it in Gaza. If you need to operate militarily in Rafah, uh, apply a different tactic, a different strategy, protect the, the civilians and provide also a tangible strategy uh, for the day after, uh, Biden would say Netanyahu has not implemented this so far. He has made many announcements and of course the, the war is going on, but he hasn't done the ground operation in, in Rafah to the extent that they have operated in Gaza and Khan Yunus and other places in the Gaza Strip. So he would say that this is our merit. And of course, if you look at the behavior of the United States at the recent uh, United Nations Security Council resolution where they abstained uh, in face of a unanimous vote in, in, in favor of a ceasefire, then you can say, okay, the Americans are applying some pressure on Netanyahu, but Netanyahu is coldly, of course, calculating that he might not be ousted before uh, President Biden is ousted, ousted because he uh, definitely invests in a Republican uh, victory in the next presidential election, and Donald Trump would be his favorite candidate. Daniel, thank you very much for your analysis. Daniel Gerlach there. Uh, joining us from San Francisco, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Let's take a look now at some of the other stories making news. The next vessels carrying aid to the Gaza Strip have left Cyprus. Almost 400 tonnes of desperately needed food and other supplies are on board. It was organised by an American and a Spanish charity. The shipment comes more than two weeks after the last one arrived on the shores of Gaza. A munitions depot on the outskirts of the Indonesian capital Jakarta is ablaze after a number of explosions. A spokesperson for Indonesia's military says the facility is used to store expired ammunition. Jakarta authorities evacuated nearby residents. No casualties have been reported. Germany's Vice Chancellor Robert Habeck has delivered a stark warning for the future of Europe. In an Easter address, he said the EU must be prepared to defend itself against military attacks in light of the war in Ukraine. We long for peace, yes. But the honest, bitter answer is that there will probably not be a quick, good end, even if we wish otherwise. We have to adapt to the threat situation. Anything else would be naive. Therefore, we would be well advised to invest more in our own security. We, Germany, the European Union, must protect ourselves all around, including from military attacks. Well, Fabrice Portier was a NATO director of policy planning. I asked him if he agrees there'll be no quick and peaceful end to the war. Well, I think uh, I tend to agree, but it, the longer I think we make up our minds on delivering certain types of long-range weapons, or delivering the kind of quantity of artillery shells that the Ukrainians need to defend and, and hopefully push back against Russian forces, the longer it takes us uh, to make those decisions, the longer uh, and, and you, in a way, the more elusive the peace will be. Well, Habeck said Europe must adapt to threats. Uh, is the EU doing that effectively or is all of this way too slow for you? Well, I think we are clearly seeing a strategic awakening uh, across Europe and across the West that uh, now we are no longer living in a peace uh, time, but we are living in some kind of pre-war time where we need to prepare for the worse. Uh, however, I think the dilemma we face is, is very simple and I'm not sure it has yet uh, properly sunk in. Either we are going to contain Russia at the border, at the Ukrainian-Polish border, or we are going to contain Russia at the Russian-Ukrainian border. And I think what we do to help Ukraine 
uh, uh, get back its occupied territories and win this war will decide on the form of containment and the resource intensiveness of this containment for the coming decade. Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk says war is no longer a concept from the past. It is real and it started over two years ago. The most worrying thing at the moment is that literally any scenario is possible. He says we haven't seen a situation like this since 1945. What are Europe's leaders trying to achieve with such warnings? Well, I think they're also trying to mobilize uh, each other uh, and because I, I don't think there's yet a full consensus among the European Council, uh, uh, between the European Council leaders, that we need to prepare for war and we need to prepare our industry and our citizens. Uh, and then, of course, there is also a message sent to European voters and citizens that uh, we need to uh, face the cost that war will a war preparation will require and that the best way to prevent war is if we have a very solid defense like what the the polish uh, government is doing by spending up to four four percent of its gdp in defense the world bank estimates that every year humans produce more than two billion tons of garbage worldwide at least a third isn't managed in an environmentally safe manner in Western India, a grassroots initiative aims to create waste-free communities. Every morning, workers from a women's group here in Gaulinagar set off with small carts to collect garbage. It's more than just a job. They want to change the way people handle their waste. Every day we collect nearly 350 kilos of wet waste from the community and almost 550 kilos of dry waste, like paper and plastic. Residents now know how to segregate their garbage and keep it ready for pickup. Blue for dry and green for wet waste. The waste is then brought to this collection point, where it is further sorted by other group members. Mangal's group was set up in 2015. Its aim is to generate income for women through work that helps improve living conditions in their communities. Today, the municipal corporation pays their salaries. That's because it sees their work as a valuable service to the city. They are doing something which is good and something which is quote-unquote honorable and not something which is to be looked down upon. It has also resulted into a cleaner slum. It has resulted into a more segregated waste coming out of the slums and also helping our gardens uh, from the waste that gets That's generated. Well. The women's work serves a wider goal, to turn Pimpri Chinswat into a zero-waste city. Its strategy has brought grassroots activists on board. Archana More devised fun ways for kids to keep their school clean, like crafting a so-called monster bottle to collect plastic. She also trained teachers to continue the work with pupils in their classrooms. For many, sorting trash has become second nature. Whenever I eat chips, biscuits, so instead of throwing them in the dustbin, I remember that Archana Didi told that we don't have to throw it in the dustbin, we have to throw it in this monster bottle. Experts welcome such initiatives, but warn that it will take more than grassroots efforts for the city to make the transition to zero waste. By considering uh, waste management as a fully municipal category, as a property of the uh, municipality, from which there is a slow transition, which is happening to think of waste as also a societal responsibility, where all generators of waste are also responsible for waste management. Uh, I think that is the slow transition which one sees happening in Indian cities, which is positive. Residents, young and old, are changing their waste disposal habits. A small step in the bigger picture? Yes, but it's making a difference nevertheless. Lastly, in Europe, the clocks skip ahead overnight. Some people will be complaining about losing an hour of their night. For Austrian pensioner Gerhard Wein, the imminent change is somewhat time intensive. He has a collection of some 2,000 clocks and timepieces. Twice a year, when the clocks move forward or back, he and his wife spend at least three hours getting all of the clocks to tick at the right time. Up next, our reporter looks at the Russian opposition in exile and what it's capable of. I'm Ben Fazulan. See you next hour.